Joker 2. Uh, yes, I just see that uh, someone just uh, joined. Uh, all right, people are joining now. Hello everyone, for the, for the uh, participants who have just uh, joined, we're going to start within some like three or four minutes more. Oh, just, uh, we're just waiting for, uh, for all the attendees to, 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 uh, to enter the, the webinar. Hello again, uh, for the people who just joined it, we're going to give just a few more minutes, two to three more minutes before we're starting. Oh, I'm just waiting for uh, everybody to, to, to join. All right, one more minute. All right. Well, let's start. If that's okay with you, uh, then you know the people will be will be joining. And in any case, of course, we will be recording the the, the webinar huh, and sharing it with the, the people who register at the later stage. All right. So, um, yeah. thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, uh, Brice Date and Professor Karen Fernandez for being uh, here with me today. Welcome to uh, everybody. Today, we are going to be dedicating this uh, next, let's say, 45 minutes to one hour or oh, to, to an interactive uh, presentation in which we're going to be speaking about uh, one of the five models who are delivered uh, during the first two years of our global doctorate. Uh, my name is Carlos Lopez, and I am in charge of recruitment for the, for the program. And uh, yet again, thank you very much, Professor Fernandez. We know we have a very, you have a very, very busy schedule uh, nowadays. You are taking new responsibilities at Durham. And uh, Brice, uh, you too, it, it, it is important to say that you, you, you made this uh, huge effort today. It's a, it's a holiday here in France, a very important one. And Brice is 
at the airport in between in between airplanes. So I'm just about to uh, depart to Dublin. Right? So um, thank you uh, again, and uh, let's start. Uh, one of the objectives of this um, of this webinar uh, was, uh, of course, uh, to speak about the model, but uh, I would say um, as importantly, speak about you. All right, you, Professor Date and Professor Fernandez. So, if uh, if that's okay with you, could you please tell us more about who you are? Bryce, uh, do you want to go? Hello. <laughs> uh. Hi, everyone. Um, so, my name is um, Bryce Date. I'm an um, associate professor of strategy and innovation management at EM Young Business School. So my background is in uh, engineering. So I graduated in uh, industrial engineering in, in France. Um, then I did uh, my master's degree in management science. And then into um, my doctorate. I spent some time a little bit at uh, MIT during my doctorate. And then I worked for uh, four years at um, Imperial College in London. And then I joined EM a few years ago. And I've been uh, teaching strategy and innovation management. And in my research, I started by looking at uh, how technological change occurs in, uh, in industry and about um, the diffusion of innovation. And then I switched towards the competitive dynamics between companies in technology-based industry and looking at both the technological aspect but also the um, organizational design choices in terms of um, experimentations, uh, learning, and uh, organizational autonomy of different units. So my latest paper has been with the uh, work that I've done over 10 years with uh, Automobile Lamborghini. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Bryce. Um, so I'm Kieran Fernandez, and I am a professor in operations management at Durham University Business School. The partners, as a partner, both we and EM Leon are working on this uh, global DBA. Um, I'm also currently the executive dean for the faculty. Um, prior to joining uh, Durham, I used to be a professor at York University and before that at Warwick University. Um, my education is, I did my first degree in uh, mechanical engineering, and then I did my master's in industrial engineering and another master's in systems engineering uh, from MIT. I did a PhD in engineering from Warwick. And I worked for a few years in the US after that, uh, basically as a subsystems engineer on the space program. And, and I spent quite a bit of time designing um, what are called as the turbo pumps that you probably see or used to see anyway on the old space shuttle. So these are the pumps that attach. And that's what I spent uh, time doing. Uh, and I got more and more interested as I was working on that, on uh, how can such a small part, you know, pretty much drive this entire engine? And what is the innovation that takes place? And because of that, I got more and more excited and interested in innovation, but innovation from an operations management perspective. And that's really what I started working on. And that's broadly what I've been doing for the last few years. And in the module, this is what we will be talking about, uh, not per se on the space shuttle, but on why, the, the, uh, why innovation is so exciting. Because you look at innovation from different lens. You know, Bryce looks at it from a strategy lens. I look at it from an operations lens. But nevertheless, it is such an important part of any organization. Uh, if you're not innovating, you no, cannot survive. It's, it's as simple as that. And it doesn't matter what organization you are part of, even as a university, as a business school, we have to innovate. Uh, if you're in, in a social enterprise, you have to innovate. If you are in a charity, you have to innovate. If you're in a traditional manufacturing company, you have to innovate. So in our module, we will be looking at some very exciting examples and models of how and why organizations need to innovate and what are the patterns you observe. So that's briefly about me. Thank you very much, both. Uh, that's, a, that's a extremely interesting yet again. Um, you are a poster 
the teachers or the organizers of uh, of uh, or or model or uh, uh, innovation and technology management. Um, and it is important, of course, uh, to, to, to remind uh, that this is a joint program. So we have uh, two professors every time teaching the, the model. So uh, this makes, uh, makes it extremely rich, as, of course, we have two different uh, perspectives. All right? um, so you are both, yet again, the teachers, the organizers, uh, but you do a variety of other things. You are also researchers uh, yourselves. Uh, Brice, you were mentioning your research on, uh, on uh, Lamborghini. Uh, it's a research that has been taken for several years, if I'm not mistaken, you know. And uh, Professor, Professor Fernandez, uh, same. Uh, you have also been researching. You, so one of your latest papers is one you, you gave me last time. Thank you very much for having reading it. It is right here, Blueprint for Smart Cities. And, uh, and I would uh, like very much if you could just tell us a bit more about uh, these, uh, these projects you are working on. Okay, well, um, I the project with Lamborghini started at November 2010, and I had just been finishing some work and research with um, um, IBM and, and Nokia, and looking at how they had created um, business and innovation ecosystems, and that's uh, another paper that was published. And from that, um, I was interested in working with um, um, Ducati, actually, the project started with, a, we went to Ducati and say, okay, hello, I would like to uh, do something with you. And um, my colleague at uh, the University of Bologna said, oh, actually, I think uh, Lamborghini would be interested. And we wanted to look at how those technology-based um, luxury firms can still manage to get a competitive advantage while depending extensively on the innovations and ideas um, and competencies of their some of their suppliers so this is how the project started and we looked at the we arrived in 2010 just before the start of production of the aventador so the Lamborghini aventador so we had and we were really looking at um, how different types of uh, subsystem so the gearbox to carbon monocoque the supercapacitor and push box suspension, all of these were really radical innovation in the um, automotive industry that had never been done before on a series production. So we were conducting research on this and then we realized that, well, it's very interesting, but um, I'm not sure in itself there was um, something new in terms of from the, what we know in terms of uh, co-development of technology with your suppliers, partners. As we were collecting data, and I, I travel all across um, Europe to meet um, companies like Erlins or in the U UK, Sweden, Germany, Italy. And as we were interviewing all these different people, we realized that, well, the significance of the project is interesting. Why did uh, Lamborghini wanted to push so far in terms of uh, technological innovation performance. And we sat down and we had a kind of, uh, in the research, what happens is that as you collect data, you also analyze it in, at the same time. And we had a moment when we said, mm, so what's the story here? What's really interesting? And we realized that this company that had been acquired in 98, 99, had been really, the parent companies, so Audi, Volkswagen, were really pushing on the Lamborghini to adopt a standardization, shared processes, shared components, same suppliers, and that could be seen in some of their, their the cars. So the, the Gallardo, very successful, but uh, very highly integrated with the Volkswagen Group. And it was a group platform. And at some point, Lamborghini decided to say, well, we want to do something different. We want to really build um, a Lamborghini the way a Lamborghini should be built. So it was a bit of uh, two years of negotiation. And then the, they were allowed to step out of the group platform and develop um, the car on their own with radical technology like the carbon monocoque um, and then success. And as we were collecting this, uh, the data in the next phase, so then interviews with and all the, the board of directors of Lamborghini, some of also the 
executive uh, on the board of Audi, also the chairman um, of, of, on the board of uh, Volkswagen. We, the story starts to emerge a little bit differently in terms of the relationship between a unit and its parent. So we started to do a literature review on the concept of organizational autonomy and we realized that there were some interesting angles, things we could not really understand that the previous theories could not really explain what happened uh, in the Lamborghini no case. So if you follow the normal uh, literature, you say, well, this is not possible. But we, we observed it. So we had to explain how it was possible that this company that was on a trajectory to becomes to becoming um, highly integrated within uh, the, the acquire group, managed to regain autonomy. So we developed um, after a lot of analysis and checking, then we developed a process model that explains how uh, organizational autonomy is negotiated between the parent and the unit. And that allows to explore and develop new um, technological capabilities on which the unit can base its competitive advantage, its differentiation. And then after a while, the parent can absorb and transfer some of those new capabilities up to the parent, which in turn decrease the difference between the unit and the parent. And then they start pushing again to say, we want to be different. So we have this kind of uh, oscillation between more autonomy, less autonomy, which is creates an engine for renewal of capabilities. And uh, so it's been quite exciting. And in fact, what, um, what we heard um, through the feedbacks that we've done regularly with Lamborghini is that uh, some of the other brands now in the Volkswagen group are like, eh, how come Lamborghini were allowed to develop something out of a group platform and uh, we want to do something different and so this process of negotiations. So that led to then um, a literature review that we are trying to do that we now is uh, revising and submit at the Journal of Management on the concept of organizational autonomy. And we're looking at uh, maybe possibly doing action research with the Volkswagen group. So action research is when you come in as a researcher, but um, your, your work actually is implemented in the company. So, but it's both a kind of consulting or at the same time it's research. So it's a different, slight, slightly different approach. You don't, in terms of methodology, you don't uh, approach it like a, for a normal academic paper, but um, quite exciting to, to see if we can explore that further. No, Sorry, I can't talk very loud because I'm in the, yeah. <laughs> I'm in the business, sure. business. Business lounge. Uh, <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. For uh, the people just. Uh, oh, we, we, are, we are losing you a little. The, the, the call is breaking a little, price. I'm just going to explain it quickly for the people who just joined. Um, uh, Professor Date was uh, was explaining his research. He has been researching for for uh, well ever since 2010 uh, uh, on the and with uh, uh, Lamborghini Motors and uh, Ducati. So uh, he was pretty much explaining his his research. The reason why I was asking uh, 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 Brice and Karen to to tell about their the the research is because uh, well you know this research also uh, inspires a lot what they are teaching in the in in this very model. So, uh, Professor Fernandez, could you please tell us a little more about Blueprint for Smart Cities? Yeah. <clears throat> so I mean, I've always been very interested and excited to understand how large scale systems work. You know what makes them Take what makes them interesting? How can we achieve these large scale projects? So this is something which I've always been very passionate about. So the report which Carlos is talking about is a study we did around uh, smart cities. Now, we all heard about the word smart city. Okay, and in, in fact, everybody's talking about smart city. And when people use the word smart city, they have a particular idea in their mind. You know, they think about this big super city 
with loads of technology, there's internet of things everywhere, drones flying, everything is automated, um, RFID technology in every corner, everything that is happening is captured. This is the impression people have of a smart city. And what we have tried to in this work says, firstly, that's not true because we have cities, for example, in Durham, if you come as part of your course to Durham, it's a very traditional city. You know, it's a city that has existed as a city from the Roman times, very old city. And if you look at the city, narrow lanes, very old buildings, some buildings going back to almost in the university, 12th century. Now, can this city not be smart? Can we also not be in this smart situation? Of course we can. Or perhaps you live in a rural community, or perhaps you live in part of the world where you are in a smaller area and they also can be smart. So in this project, when we use the word smart, what we are trying to do is to create a blueprint for every city on many issues. So if you think about some of the big challenges in a city, how can we innovate in this? So the most obvious example, which is perhaps not the best example that comes to mind is the most recent tragedy that you have read in the newspaper yesterday. There was a huge massacre in Texas because of a gun crime incident. So crime, and gun crime in particular, is a problem in society. It is a problem in a smart city too. And in our report, we have an example that says, what is the role of a smart city, particularly with crime and gun crime? So the model we talk about, for example, this is just an example of what, how we perceive smart city. So if you think about crime, there are a few things that need to happen for a crime to take place. You need to have a motivated offender to meet a desirable target in an accessible place without the presence of a guardian. Now, if all of these conditions are true, there is a likelihood of a crime to take place. Now, in a smart city, what you can do is you can look at the motivation of an offender. You can look at desirability of a target you can look at accessibility of a place and you can look at a presence of a guardian. So for example, what do I mean by motivation of an offender? Motivation offender is people behave in a certain way. We know how people behave. We know how targets are acquired. We know how policing system works. Now in a smart city, you can model all of this and it doesn't need to be a high tech city. It can be any city. And what we say is in any city, when we say smart, there are social issues like crime. How do you tackle crime? To make it smarter, to make it better for the well being of all. So, smart city is not just about technology, it's about how you create an ecosystem for citizens to live side by side and have a lifestyle around well being. And that's what that report is all about. It is what we are calling a social contract a social contract between citizens, policymakers, universities, and business. And through this social contract mechanism, we talk about in our report how innovation can take place. So that's what that report is all about. So we are talking in that report about very important issues, issues around education, issues around crime, issues around transportation, issues around well-being, issues around health, and that's what that whole study is all about. So when I am looking at a particular project, I'm always looking at what is it that we don't know from a complex perspective, big projects, big things. You know, if there is a company with 5,000, 10,000 supply chain companies attached to it, those supply chains have further four, 5,000 supply chain that has more. And they're all around the world. It's not a simple problem. It's not a hierarchical problem. These are all cross-connected like a huge mesh. And in this mesh, the question is, how does innovation take place? How do you innovate in one part that has an effect on other part? 
So that's what I have been studying for, for, for some time. And that's what I find very, very exciting and enjoying. So that's my research, Carlos. Thank you very much for, uh, for all this. So um, every, every uh, occasion that I, that I have uh, when I discuss with, uh, with uh, uh, candidates, uh, we always discuss the subject of creating positive impact. Right. And, uh, and of course, you know, a, a program of, of this kind is, um, is, is excellent in order to create knowledge in the middle of all these that we are all experiencing. And so we are uh, well, in, a, in an amazing time and, uh, and, uh, and there are so many things that need to be put together in order to create the knowledge that is going to set the path for the future. So um, uh, thank you for, uh, for this, uh, 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 Professor Fernandez. And now I would like to get uh, more into into the the model in itself right so uh, could you please tell us uh, a little more about what this model is all about okay so i will probably start and so this module is a module entitled innovation and technology management which both bryce and i teach jointly as a team the module is taught in Paris, so we will we look forward to seeing you in Paris. Um, great when you great great food. That's important, which is important always to remember. So we both have been, as we have explained to you earlier, very active researchers working with industry. We understand what core knowledge development means. We know what co-creation of knowledge means. So we use all of this experience, and we have designed a very exciting module for you. Which we have, uh, which we are planning to offer. But before I go into the details of this particular module, I just want to highlight how we have structured the module. So the module is delivered on three days: day one, day two, and day three. We start at nine and roughly try to finish at five uh, on on most days. And in this particular module, at the heart of it is innovation. But we have built innovation on three pillars, which you see there. We have built it on technology. We have built it around people and process. And we have built it around ecosystem. So if you think about innovation as a stool, it has three legs. It's built on the concept that technology is very important for innovation. But it, so is the people and the process that interact with technology. And all of this creates the ecosystem. And that is as important. And you can't have this tool with only two legs. You need all three. So day one, we dedicate to the technological view. Day two, we dedicate to people process view. And day three, we do this around the ecosystem view. And what we have done is we have put a lot of time and effort, me and particularly Bryce, I have to say, because the module is offered in, in Paris. So he's doing a lot more of the uh, hard work than I am in terms of setting the program. Now, there will be some changes to what you see. On day one, um, generally what we are trying to do there is we introduce you to technology, particularly we are talking about emerging technology. And on day two, we are talking about, I said to you, people process from an organizational perspective. And the third thing is about ecosystem. Now, I won't go into each and every session, but what you will see here is we have sessions where me and Bryce will teach, and Bryce will talk briefly on, on, on that. But we also have a number of guest lectures, and the ones that are typically on at the end of the day, which we have not, we and I will talk about who we invited last year, who we think we will invite this year. So we have industrial experts. We have industrial experts, um, which, which I'll talk about, who we bring to the table. Uh, we have very exciting tours where we are going to next year go to the Orange 5G Labs, which um, uh, Bryce has organized. But we also will be going to Station F. Absolutely brilliant. And I'll show you some pictures of this year, which we took when we went to Station F. And over the three days, we have a very lively interactive session. Our model is very simple. Have fun while learning. So it's important that we have fun, but at the same time we are learning. And I teach two parts of it on day one and day two. I start day one 
with the concept of artificial intelligence and specifically focusing on how I believe games and gamification is going to be central to innovation. And on day two, I talk about specifically on innovation networks and communities. And in this, I particularly focus on how people are absolutely central to creating innovation systems in a way. So I don't know, Bryce, if you want to add anything to the timetable. Yeah, I can just briefly um, explain what I do in my session. So in my session, I will bring, um, so we can have the same vocabulary and the same grammar. So then we can talk to, about uh, innovation and we all have the common understanding of the concept and the dynamics and what happens. So how technology evolves, what is radical, disruptive, but also specifically how the interaction between technological evolution, market demand, and uh, com um, what company do and competencies they have actually change, constantly change the competitive dynamics in, in, in an industry. So really I'm trying to, I will introduce a, a very neat model that uh, uh, I developed with my external supervisor at MIT on the dynamics of uh, competition in technology-based industry, linking how the technology evolves, the market, the demand heterogeneity, and the strategic moves by competitors. Um, in, on the Thursday afternoon, the 5G lab, um, this is where they experiment with uh, startup partners, uh, other and uh, big larger company on what could be the use case for certain um, in, in different industries of using 5G uh, in terms of products, services. Uh, so they will show you some of the demonstrators, pilots, application they've made with the startup. Um, and a physical object in which you can, when you enter into the environment, you can actually um, immerse yourself in how they explore these potential futures. Otherwise, if you if you organize a, a visit to a startup, most of the time you see people uh, sitting down at the at the computer desk. So, <laughs> but, um, so hope that's what we'll, um, we'll see in, in Orange and then um, Station F. Um, I'm still trying to get access to, but no, not to get access to finalize with uh, La French Tech, with the um, the French government arms of who organize a lot of things around the technological startups and they have an office in Station F. So last year we visited and this year we visit Station F and I'll try to also include a presentation by a French tech which is a government institution. Thank you very much. Do you want to talk well, about, please, uh, please, yeah. you want to talk about um, the potential company for the yes. conference on Thursday evening? That's right. So what I'll now briefly is just show you, share with you some pictures we took last year or rather this year, uh, but for you the previous year anyway. Um, so these are some of the pictures uh, we took at Station F. And this is uh, an incubator uh, about half an hour or so from the um, EM Lyon campus in Paris. Uh, really a revolutionary setup where, you know, what you see in these diagrams are a lot of startups. So on the right-hand side, if you see like a cubicle there on the top, that's basically uh, some of the old cargo boxes that have been converted, refurbished into uh, meeting rooms uh, in Station F. Uh, so our students had an opportunity to go meet startup companies, see how the startup companies can incubate, innovate in this sort of ecosystem called Station F. Um, what you see here is again, you know, the, the whole setup. But what was interesting is it's not just new startups. You also see established companies providing services to these startups. So for example, you will see a logo at the, on the left-hand side of Google. So Google has a team based in Station F along with Microsoft and many other companies that provide the wrapper that is needed for these startups to take off. So really, really exciting companies in the tech world, there were some companies in femtech, there were companies in fintech, there were companies in all sorts of very, very exciting areas. And not all companies are tech, by the way. 
Uh, we also had an opportunity to visit IBM labs, uh, which next year will be the Orange 5G labs. So it will be, but nevertheless, just to give you an idea of uh, having an opportunity to see how companies like IBM or companies like Orange spend time, energy and effort trying to develop innovation, innovative products, the processes they adopt. In this case, the example you see is um, the lady on the top left is explaining how they are using sustainable design thinking as a model for delivering new solutions in IBM. And the gentleman to the right hand side on the top is showing how blockchain as a technology was developed to support different types of supply chain. So what you will get is a very rich experience, real world experience. Um, and to make it much more real, we invited this year, uh, hopefully same colleagues, but the similar caliber colleagues to come listen to what you are doing and give you some live feedback not just me and Bryce from an uh, academic perspective, but from an industrial perspective. So we had, um, so basically Bryce invited Daniel uh, Kohilo, who's the principal at Circle Consulting. He used to work for many years at McKinsey, uh, really very exciting individual. Uh, we had uh, Dennis Garden, who is the director of innovation and future tech at MBDA Systems, well-known company. And we also had uh, Dr. Jonathan Sims, who came all the way from UK to meet our students, uh, who's the chief procurement officer for at NG, a big global company in the area of uh, energy and energy systems. So overall, uh, Carlos, you know, the program was very exciting, uh, very, very energetic. Students really loved it. I mean, I loved meeting the students, uh, so did Bryce. I don't know, Bryce, if you want to add something more to, to our industrial experts, no. So it's um, the, um, also the way uh, the, the way we've designed the program is that the module is that, uh, so we have the, the lecture, we have the company visit, but also you have these moments where um, the, you as participants in the DBA program can share your ideas in terms of what research you have in mind. And those, um, um, in industry, those practitioners, those managers can give you um, a very complimentary feedback and comments in terms of, uh, okay, I can understand that this would be interesting from the theoretical and literature perspective, but does it apply in, in business? What does it mean? What are the questions that your research may, may raise for me? And you can bounce it like this and see if you can have, um, if it resonates with current business issues. And if you can find a research topic that is, um, there's a gap in the literature, the theory doesn't explain, and the practitioners from their perspective say, oh, that could be interesting. Then you you get a very exciting project. And that's a very good sign because then you have, I don't so want to say a highway, but a, a clear direction of where to go. So, that's their role. Their role is uh, they bring their expertise and, and they, they're also aware of uh, what research is. So this is also quite important. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Exactly, well, uh, indeed, this is, a, this is a very important subject uh, when you're going to exchange with, uh, with candidate, candidates. Uh, often, or I would say all the time, they ask me about uh, uh, whether we also have practitioners uh, who are who are uh, part of the part of the program, I always reply that pretty much our professors themselves are also practitioners and they have vast experience in 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 corporate. So, but then of course you know we have all these uh, all these uh, other uh, remarkable people who are who are also uh, guest speakers in the program and make it of course way richer and and way more. Interesting. I wanted to wanted to uh, add something uh, um, in regards to Station F. Or just uh, just a little detail. Station F is uh, well, it used to be. Now it's in that is the second uh, biggest incubator in the world. Um, they call it a campus, a campus incubator, and it was uh, created by Xavier Niel. Xavier Niel happens to be maybe the most uh, um, influential entrepreneur in France or oh, French. He's the creator of uh, Free, or oh, correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> Kieran Abris, but uh, 
think it is indeed the case. Um, and then, well, he created this as, um, because he's a visionary and he's been, of course, to support all these companies. We were speaking about more than a thousand companies that have an incubator uh, incubated there uh, at station uh, F. So it was a great experience as well, uh, very inspiring. And, uh, and well, uh, I wanted to, to ask you something, uh, something else, you know, uh, uh, Kieran and, and, and Breeze, you know, just getting more into the matter of the program and uh, sorry, getting more into the matter of the, of the model and the research, right? So research is the heart of this, of this DBA. Right? And, uh, and I wanted to ask you, uh, in your opinion, uh, of course, why is this, kind of model relevant for global doctorate studies? It's a very good question. I'll, I'll start with it. So I, I give you two very practical examples. So just before this meeting today, I was invited to attend a session with Johnson & Johnson, which is a big pharmaceutical company, by a student from this particular DBA program. Uh, Sam Yarwood. So Sam contacted me and, uh, a few weeks ago and she said, I'm working on a project with Johnson & Johnson as part of my doctoral work. Are you free to participate in a focus group? Okay, example number one. Last year, I had um, a student called Ashish Kakar uh, who was working on a project. He contacted me and said, oh, Kiran, you know, the, the, you, you, you're starting on this uh, smart city project. Uh, I'm doing some work around this area. I'm very keen to work together. And in fact, in that report, you will see he is one of the co-authors of that, okay? So I give you an example of the two cohorts that we have taught now, cohort one and cohort two, and this will be our cohort three. In all the cases, some of the students have found what we have been talking to be so relevant and so practical and so exciting, but at a doctoral level. Okay, so this is where they feel they are pushing the boundaries of the work they are doing, industrial work they are doing, but with the sort of research rigor that is needed at a doctoral level. And so in both is this example, in the case of Johnson & Johnson, they are wanting to launch a new therapeutic drug that is potentially going to be a personalized medical therapy for cancer treatment. And they want to understand how innovation can work. And they want to use some of the models we taught in the module as the framework to take it forward. So this is a practical example of a DBS student like you, who will be coming in cohort three, that is taking something and applying it and working to basically co-create knowledge along with the academics, along with the research that we have been working on, along with the sort of exciting things that you can. So I provide two practical examples. So this to me is important. Now, what you need to realize is one of the things we will ask you to do is to read and digest a lot of research papers. Now, initially you might feel, ah. Oh, this is very much uh, hard work, but once you start doing it, you start to almost uncover the mysteries of what is going on in the world of innovation management from different lenses, from the strategy lens, perhaps as what Bryce will talk to you about, from an operational lens, perhaps what I will talk about, but also things you learn in other modules. In fact, some of the presentations students were doing in on our program was from a leadership perspective because that is something they learned in the module. So there is a connectivity between different modules from a research perspective. So research, but research not for the sake of research, but research for the sake of co-creation, research for the sake of having practice that has an impact, research for the sake of impact to society. This is what we teach and this is what we train you to do. And I think this is the power to answer the question, Carlos. This is the important element of an unique element, and not just important, unique element of this Durham EM Leon partnership. We bring strengths that are complementary, but with a very clear focus in mind. And in every example I can give you, I mean, 
uh, and I'm sure the students will talk to their previous colleagues. You look at all the doctoral work they're working, is very applied. It has a very clear focus. There is an agenda. This is, but at a very high level, it's a doctoral piece of work with a clear impact. That's perfect. Thank you very much, Brice. Would you like to add something here? Um, no, the, the question is, uh, people that are considering a DBA are already intellectually curious and I don't know, you can, you can see in, in the module that you teach, oh, so it, it will not really resonate with all the papers with everyone, but you know that when you look around and you say, oh, oh by the way, this paper, this, and oh, someone's eyes will go to, oh, and they start to pick up and it's like a thread and then suddenly they're like, wow, okay, they want to learn more. And that's uh, the excitement of the, of the research, which, because it's, in this kind of program, you actually, have the time for not it's, yeah, it's dedicated to this kind of pursuit and it's a rare occasion because normally you have to go fast or dele delegate and then you have to campaign and reports but uh, in this case it's the, the curiosity and the satisfaction of going to explore new things and going to the edge of in that specific topic that's the edge and i, I can push it a little bit further myself that's uh, an exciting part of the, the research and you can see the excitement and the intellectual interest of the, of the, the participant in the class. It is, I agree with you, oh, it's extremely fulfilling intellectually for having had the opportunity to live at least some part of it. Um, there was a well. There is another uh, um, another question, but also something that is very intriguing to me. Huh? Uh, yet again, when I speak with candidates, uh, and uh, quite often they do not necessarily get the right uh, uh, the right idea of what is going on nowadays in terms of research. Right? We believe that research is something that might be a little old fashioned. While having a look at your uh, at your at your course uh, uh, some weeks ago. I was realizing about all these new, let's say, techniques or or uh, maybe tactics and strategies that uh, you are coming up with uh, in order to collect data and to analyze the data and to come up, of course, with uh, with this so-called uh, knowledge creation. Could you please tell us a bit more about what is going on nowadays in terms of the evolution of research in itself? <laughs> Yeah, it's a good question. Research is all, as you rightly say, is, is evolving in, in many ways, you know, new ways to create frameworks, new ways to analyze, new ways to uh, construct theory. Um, but nevertheless, at the heart of this is a very simple question. What is the phenomena that we are trying to solve? What do we know about the phenomena? What do we not know about the phenomena? And then the question is, why do we not know what it is that we not know? So these are the basic questions in, in, in terms of whatever the technique. So whatever it is, the, so the, the, the fourth question is important. Why do we not know what we don't know? And the answer could be very simple. Um, and the simple answer could be because it's not worth in terms of the problem. And if that is the answer, you don't need to worry, you proceed to something else. Maybe the answer is, Oh, in the past, we just were unable to answer this question because we either didn't have the data, we didn't have the technique, we didn't know the know-how, there wasn't enough research. That's why we could not solve this problem. Now that becomes very exciting. We say, oh, okay, we now have a lot of data. We have a lot of new things. We have a lot of new ways to look at it. Now, if this happens for a number of reasons. Like one is technology, which is a very simple answer. You know, I mean, in, in the past, uh, analyzing simple amounts of data took a lot amount of energy, a lot of effort, a lot of things. And even, and I just don't mean quantitative data, even looking at surveys. You know, in the past, people were happy with few hours surveys, few people surveys, whereas now people are looking at hundreds of people with thousands of hours of data analysis. Now, one example which I will give in my lectures 
on day one is about gamification. And I'm very passionate about it, not just because I like to play games, but it's because I have shown and I believe it is such a beautiful way to collect and data and trial data. Now, some of the participants will be familiar with games. Now, you know, if you are playing a first shooter game or even a third shooter game or a second shooter game in, in terms of games, you know, you will realize there are, it's not just you, you have 20, 30, 40 million people playing the game at the same time as you. You know, this is a huge amount of people. Now imagine, forget the game, same number of people, and I change the setting and say, okay, this is a road, loads of cars going on this road. I want to go from point A to point B. All of these millions of people are going to try to find the most optimum way to go from A to B. Some will use a technique, it will not work. Some will use another technique and that will not work. Some will find a new way. Some will find a cooperative mechanism. So imagine you being able to do this in a matter of minutes using this huge computational power of millions and millions of people to solve this problem. I want to go from point A to point B. Now, this can give you huge amounts of knowledge on how you can achieve it. Now, if you use that as your data collection instrument, you are basically solving a problem which is so much superior than you're running a simulation with one data set, which you could run for hundreds of times with thousands of combinations or surveys. Imagine how many surveys you would have had to run to answer this question. Imagine if you were doing qualitative research, how many people you would have had to interview to figure out you need to go from this to this in a simple way. So what I'm saying is technology is now evolving at such a rate, but it's not just technology. A lot of technology is free. It's something that you can build on free and open source engine. And that's the, I think that's the beauty of it. You know, you can get so much things and I won't particularly name companies right now in this conversation, but there are so many companies that are willing and happy to give researchers free software to solve problems. Now, this is changed in my view. The fundamentals have not changed. Phenomena, what the problem is, but how we go about it is, is completely different. You can now solve problems of one company with 10,000 supply chain companies which you were perhaps, perhaps never able to solve in the past. It's just an impossible task to do in the past. You would have to have a lot of very simple models you would have to do to solve those problems because by the nature of how it is. So I think this, these are some of the big trends in what's happening and we will help you in this journey. Thank you so very much for that. Um, Brace, would you like to add something to this? Topic? I don't know, just um, maybe just to point out the phenomenon, the phenomena are also changing because there are <laughs> new use case, new organization forms, new values, culture, policies. So the phenomena in, in, in themselves are also changing. So it's a constantly moving um, field. Between. The phenomena, the methods, the data. And even in phenomena, the one thing which uh, I should have added is sometimes we thought problems are not really problems, but now we believe they are problems. I mean, the classic example is climate change or things associated with the 17 sustainable development goals. You know, even if you ask 10 years ago, many of the ones that we today consider as the 17 most important problems on earth were. 10 years ago considered not to be problems. And today we believe they are global problems. And in fact, there, there is a whole journal, high rank journal that is purely dedicated to let's flag those new phenomena that we don't understand. So it's called the Academy of Management Discovery. So people say, there's this new thing that we observe in companies and in industry where it's weird because we can't really explain it, but it's certainly would require uh, further investigation. So there's a whole journal dedicated to new phenomena, emerging, raising the questions, and then people research and publish the results in another journal. Better. Thank you very much for 
this very subject indeed. You know, uh, um, we are in a completely new, completely new era, and uh, it tends to uh, it tends to the way I see it, the way Pedro Chavi Mari sees it. Uh, it tends to keep uh, keep keep changing, keep evolving at an extremely fast pace, right? So um, it is time uh, to start imagining or designing, of course, the 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 very future. Um, well, this is a very practical question, no? Because uh, we are almost arriving at the at the at the end of the webinar. It has been one hour. Uh, I it's just that uh, when I listen to you speaking, I mean, it's 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 um, I mean, it's extremely exciting, uh, and uh, and uh, you are both very passionate professors, and the subjects are also uh, extremely interesting. So. Um, and I hope we could we could have more time to keep discussing all this. Um, but, but very practically speaking, but this is another question that I have often: How are the models evaluated? Well, in my view, there are two ways to evaluate it. There is an academic view, and the academic view is very simple: you 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 publish your piece of work. Okay, it goes through a very rigorous model. Colleagues, so if I was publishing something, colleagues like. Bryce and others from other parts of the world would read that paper that has been submitted and they would say, does this make sense? Is it nonsense? And basically, based on that, you would develop your research to a point that your peers think what you are suggesting as models in your research is a good or a viable one. And that's one view. I believe there is also another view to that. And that is no better view than to convince industry to adopt what you do and see the results of it. Industry generally, and when I use the word industry, I use not just manufacturing business, I, I talk about everything from government, in a very broad sense, the word industry, or the very broad sense of the word business. They are very good. If they feel what you're proposing is completely bonkers, there's no meaning, they will not adopt it because they have other problems to solve, very, very, which are taking far more priority. But if they feel what you're proposing is new, it's different, they haven't thought about it, and this is something very exciting and can solve the problems they are genuinely struggling with, they will adopt it and they will immediately come back to you and say, look, your model, your research does not work. Or equally, they will come back to you very quickly and say, this is really very exciting. Well done. And that also feeds back into your research in terms of publication. So I think there are two ways to look at this particular problem. Now, I don't think one is better than the other. But as a professor in a business school, I feel you need to do both. Okay, I feel we are on the practice side of research. We are not pure theoretical researchers. We need to do both theory building but we need to make sure the theory building we do has a practical relevance. Otherwise, we are ending up becoming not uh, MD in medicine, but we end up becoming a PhD in biological sciences. We are uh, MD in medicine. Our job is to make sure at the end of the day with our excellent research, we treat patients. We make sure the healthy life of a patient is basically something we focus on. And that is what we do. So I think that is my personal view on, on the, is it right or wrong? Thank you very much, uh, uh, Karen. I was, uh, I was just, uh, just wanted to, to, to be certain. So you, you were describing the evaluation of the entire program or you were specifically uh, talking about the evaluation of, of your model? Uh, uh, when you say model, you mean the models, yeah? The models we develop. I mean, I was, I was, well, I was particularly uh, asking about your your model because I understand that the other models have maybe all the ways of being evaluated, but you were specific. Oh, you mean the module? Sorry, yeah, you're the, talking module. the module. The module. Sorry, no, sorry, this is forget uh, okay. my accent, please. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Okay, okay. I thought you were talking about models, and I was. No, talking. but it was, oh. but, but it was great that you spoke about the other. The okay, other sorry. Who would have me asking? Uh, okay, how is the module evaluated? <laughs> is the question. Okay, the the module is evaluated, of course, in a number of ways. The students, first of all, have a direct say at the end of the module if they basically uh, found it to be interesting or not. And you know our students, they're very vocal. They tell you immediately if they don't like it. And equally, they will immediately tell you if they like it. So there is this. But of also, there is a quality assurance process, both at EM Leon as well as in Durham University, where we have other colleagues looking at what me and Bryce are doing. 
and saying this makes sense, this is relevant. We have an advisory board in Durham that looks at what we are proposing to teach. We have a set of external examiners that look at not just what me and Bryce are teaching, but even how we mark the module. So everything that's marked is double checked. There's a quality assurance. So there's a whole evaluation mechanism to make sure that what we are teaching is both timely, it's relevant and adds value to the student. Thank you very much for uh, the description of the evaluation of the module. And it's an assignment, by the way, just to let you know, the practical element at the end of it is students have to write a practical assignment. The assignment is about 3000 to 3500 words. It's a very practice based assignment. So for this year, students are going to pick one problem from the industry, but use some of the frameworks we have taught to solve the problem in industry. So it's a very practical hands on assignment. Thank you very much. Bryce, is, is there anything else that you would like to add? Thank you, of course, for pointing out what you pointed before. And Bryce? Is there anything else that you would like to, to, to add to this, uh, no, to this question? Thank you very much for the opportunity to really tease and uh, raise interest. So thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much to, to you both uh, for making the space on your hand, uh, agenda so for, this, uh, for this very webinar. Um, so it is the end of it. Uh, for the people who couldn't join, I'm going to be sending it uh, uh, later or to them. I'm in contact with all of them. And for the ones who joined, thank you very much for joining. If there is anything you would like to 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 ask, oh, I hope that recent Karen can have a one two minutes more. Uh, yeah, sure. Or, yeah. Otherwise, yeah. Uh, otherwise, of course, you know, I'm, we have been replying to some of the to some of the questions uh, by typing just before. Uh, but yet again, you know, we have uh, still a couple of minutes. If you if you would like to have a to to ask something. And by the way, it is a pleasure to see you. We are we are in contact already. All right. Well, okay. it seems that it is all good. Um, I wish you an excellent uh, weekend. I mean, we here in France, we are already in weekend. Uh, have a safe trip and a lovely trip back home, Bryce, who is uh, splitting between Ireland and Paris. Kieran, uh, of course, I imagine you are at, at Darham. Uh, so um, enjoy your time at that lovely place that is, uh, that is yeah. Darham. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing our students in October. In Paris. In, in January. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank in October for the model and, uh, and, and in January for the oh, Yes. All right. Um, thank you very much for everything. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.